Today we are joined by a very special guest, someone who has had his hands in a great multitude of so many great films, including but definitely not limited to 1976's King Kong, an officer and a gentleman, Tootsie, the Back to the Future trilogy, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Rain Man, The Fisher King, Batman Returns, The Firm, Little Giants, The People vs. Larry Flint, Man on the Moon, Vanilla Sky, and so much more. Um, David McGifford, a veteran producer and assistant director, turned super dad, joins us today. <laughs> and again, thank you so much for joining us. And with that introduction, I mean, how can you fail? You, you cannot fail with all those nice things that he said to you. There's no way for you to fail. <laughs> so again, welcome to the show. Listen, uh, for all the people out there, um, when they go to the f movies and, of course, they see at the end of a film, the credits begin to roll. They see all these names and they see all these descriptions of these jobs. You, of course, being an assistant director, could you explain to the people out there what an assistant director's role is specifically on set? I think the most visible thing is that um, they look like they're kind of directing traffic on the set, which is true. I mean, it's the AD's job to disseminate information, disseminate the director's wishes to the rest of the crew and mainly to facilitate the crew because the crew are the people that are making the movies and AD is watching them make the movie. And a lot of ADs make that mistake. I always tell my second assistants when they're coming along that you have to remember that you're there to help. You're not making the movie. In the pre-production, we uh, come up with what they call the shooting schedule, which is kind of the roadmap for the whole production. Um, everybody uses it, the cast uses it, the crew uses it. It lists everything that's going to be needed on a particular production day. You guys probably know this. I think, I think that covers it in a rough, in a rough way. Does that, does that role kind of fluctuate from film to film and director to director? Yes. You know, every director has a different style, a different way of running their set. I always found it uh, important to adapt to their style, not come in with my own way of doing things. I tend to be kind of soft-spoken, I'm not a yeller. And so I've almost been fired on films for not yelling. People were worried that I wasn't a strong enough presence there. But I, I found that it was uh, tense enough for crews on a set without having somebody yelling at them. So yeah, that's kind of how I conducted myself. You know, it's amazing. These people who direct are really quite incredible people. Uh, and, and so you, you have to learn their personality. At least I did. That's what I used to do. I used to wait for quite a while before I, I kind of came out. I would watch what they did. I would watch how they reacted to things. I would watch how they came forth with their ideas and stuff. And then uh, I would try to carry their tone uh, onto the set um, and, and make sure that I was mirroring what they were doing. And yeah, we'll definitely get into the directors you worked with the actors you worked with because you're i mean the people that are connected to your imdb and the films that you've worked on is just it's like every every person like the who's who of who's who of hollywood um but before we get into that i want to go back to 1973 according to imdb that was your first credit so that would put you in your early 30s if not 30 when you got started just turned 30 it was actually earlier than that that i worked on a film if you want to know how i got started yeah. Okay. I grew up in Los Angeles. It never occurred to me to work in the film business. It never even entered my mind. I had a friend who I went to college with who went to SC film school. And he called me one day out of the blue. I hadn't heard from him in a year. And he said, hey, what do you think about coming to work as second assistant director on a film with me? And I said, well, wh wh you know, wh what would I be doing? And he said, well, you don't have to worry about that. He, um, you know, you'll be working with me. I'll tell you what you need to do as we go along. I said, great, I want to do it. It was um, uh, 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 what we would call now an independent film. Uh, it was being produced by Doug Trumbull. It had a, a writer-director by the name of Tony Fouts, who probably no one knows, on, but th knows about, but he is a very good script doctor. This is an electrifying script. I had no idea what I was doing at any time. I only did what I was told to do. And then uh, two weeks later, my friend quit over a salary dispute. And... Tony Fouts came to me and said, okay, here's the deal. I will try to teach you as we go along. I've been an assistant director. I know what has to happen. If you can't keep up with me, I have to get someone who can help me because you're supposed to help me. I'm not supposed to be teaching you. I said, okay. And I faked my way through that film. And then I, 
I went through a tremendous series of, of commercials, working as a PA, music videos, early music videos with Penelope Spheros. And then I got a job as a PA on a film that Peter Fonda was directing. And my friend was the assistant director again. And they went off to Idaho to do this film called Idaho Transfer. And about a month into production, I was watching the LA uh, office. I was the PA that picked up the film, took it to the lab, ran it back to the airport. I got a call from them and they said, would you be able to fly up tomorrow? We, Peter wants you to take over as the assistant director. And my friend had quit. I owed this guy a lot. I never saw him again. That's how I got into the film business. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. It was a really steep learning curve. Um, and I found that it was something that absolutely captivated me. I couldn't believe that I'd stumbled on something that I could actually do and that I loved. Yeah, I'm always kind of um, taken back by people in the film industry that don't that don't set a that that don't like position themselves in a role like director or actor, like the thankless jobs in the in the film industry, like someone like an AD who is who is paving the way for everything to take place in a sense. But at the end of the day, it's a Robert Zemeckis film. It's a Sidney Pollack film, or it's a Tom Cruise picture. Um, only like people that really appreciate what happens on a film set truly appreciate the kind of work that people like you do. So I was just, I was curious if, if you ever aspired to go, be more than a director, or if you just loved film so much that you were satisfied with the role that you had? I thought it was something that I, that I was suited for. Uh, I felt like I was the hub of the wheel. I loved the information data flow. I'm, I'm kind of fast twitch muscles, you know, I like the, the stimulus of it. Uh, I love people and it was a people job. It wasn't a technical job at all. Uh, and uh, you had to understand what everybody did on the set. Um, but, that no, I didn't aspire to more because if I if somebody asked me, well, you know, don't you want to become a unit manager and stuff? And I said, no, because I'd spend all the money. You know, I would because I know what the crew needs. And a lot of times the UPM's job is actually not to spend all the money. It's a it's a bizarre situation. And you guys understand that, too, I'm sure. So a, a way for a UPM to look good is to not spend all the money and come in under budget. But the way for a film to look good is to spend the money where it's needed, spend all of it and, and, and put it all, all up. So no, I loved where I was. And the, um, I, I used to call, say to myself that I had the best seat in the house. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're working, you're, you're kind of mitigating potential disasters before they become disasters. And you're working, you're doing this with such an impressive list of A-listers throughout your career. There's, Tom Cruise, Dustin Hoffman, Jessica Lange, Nicole Kidman, Jim Carrey, Richard Gere, Robert Redford, Woody Harrelson, Robin Williams, Jeff Bridges. And that's like scratching the surface of who you've worked with. Um, so I just want to ask a few questions, if we can, uh, that are more actor focused in the from from your perspective as like a professional outsider watching what's going on closely on the set. Like, uh, for example, like for all those people he just named now, you probably witnessed firsthand a various range of methods and, of course, approaches to the craft. As someone who's tasked with keeping things running smoothly on set, is there a preference, preference from your perspective for which method is least dis disruptive to the set? Because, again, it can go either way here. You have some people, like you said, you, you mentioned earlier, and me and him always talk about this, like, we never wanted to be on a set where people are yelling at people because people tense up, actors get crazy, people are on their toes. Clearly this whole Tom Cruise rant thing has just happened. You know, I would back up to Tom Cruise. I entirely agreed with what he did. Somebody messed up and, and it's so dangerous out there. I mean, I don't know if you guys know uh, about how many shows have been shut down now because of COVID outbreaks when they try to ramp up and they have all this pod system and site circles and, and they're shutting down right and left and it's really difficult. And um, Tom is, is, uh, is a lot of things, but one of the things he is most is responsible. And so he feels as though he's shepherding his film along, I'm sure. So actors that, that make it easy or not easy on the set, is that what you'd like to know about? I mean, I think, you know, people say, well, gosh, those method actors, you know, they're really tough. It depends on how they conduct themselves. 
Um, some method actors put it on like a jacket right before they step onto the set. They've been preparing off to the side and that's, and that's one way. Like Michael Fox, he'd be in a conversation, we'd roll the camera, he'd step onto his mark and jump into his character and we'd call cut and he'd jump out and finish the conversation. He just put it on and off, he was used to it. Then there are people, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, except that it costs a lot of time and energy for people uh, around him. I have never seen anybody assume a role the way Jim Carrey did in Man on the Moon. Oh, yeah, wow. Ever. <clears throat> Jim Carrey disappeared in the first week of prep and came back at the rap party. No kidding. Yeah, well, I watched and, the documentary, Jim and Andy, and did? that was, okay, that was well, in then, incredible. I, I, and that was maybe a fifth of what went on. Well, it was, those are the stuff he wouldn't be liable for. He could show that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was, I, 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 I honestly think it changed him. I, I've never seen anybody inhabit a role like that. Um, Dustin Hoffman would inhabit roles. He's very famous for it, and it's true. A lot of actors do, but they do it, as you were you know, alluding to, they do it in uh, a wide range of ways. Difficult people usually have a reason for being difficult. If you can solve their difficulty, you can calm them down, and then they can get back to focusing on what they're doing. Sure, yeah. Uh, Jim Carrey went so far as to visit Andy Kaufman. Like, he was hanging out with Andy Kaufman's family, things like that, what, like his sisters or something. He had them uh, on the set. Yeah, Around to the set. Really paid off, though. In the, I mean, it felt like you were watching the embodiment of Andy Kaufman in that movie. So, from what I remember, that was the time when he said he just wanted everyone to take him serious as a serious actor, and that's why he went for it. At least that's what I remember at the time. Well, I, I've heard he goes for it every on every film. That's the only one I did with him. But I, honestly, I've never seen anything like that. So yeah. it's it's definitely no secret the stereotype of big actors kind of becoming increasingly difficult as their star rises. But I'm more interested in hearing about if there's a particular A-lister that surprised you by how humble and grounded they remained in their success. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is Puma. Just um, an incredible guy, hard to describe because he had so many facets. But I met him on Absence of Malice. And you would have never known that he was starring a film. I mean, he was hanging out with the crew. He's making popcorn for everybody. He was pulling jokes on the set and, and not uh, untimely jokes. I mean, they would be timed right, so it wouldn't take away from anything. But he was um, kind and thoughtful. Uh, and, and I was surprised by that. And then he, I, I got a call from him a couple of years later at my house. And I thought it was a prank call. I thought somebody was, you know, screwing around with me until I, I realized it really was him. He had gotten my number from Sidney Pollack and had, was asking me to be his AD on the next, on this film that he was going to direct. I was completely blown away. I didn't even know he'd been watching me, but I guess he had been. So I went off and did this film with him. And uh, he was exactly the same guy directing and starring. It was a movie called The Harry and Son, which wasn't uh, a particularly big deal, but it was probably one of the coolest ex um, experiences I ever had on a film. And um, he's the godfather to, he and Joanne are godfather to my son. He got me involved. Uh, he still owes me a lot of money for this, but he got me involved in race car driving. Uh, the same way he, he hooked crews into it. He was a stand-up guy. And, and as sweet as can be. More impressive than the actors that you've worked with are the directors that you worked alongside. Barry Levinson, Sidney Pollack, Robert Zemeckis, Terry Gilliam, Tim Burton, uh, Miles Foreman, Cameron Crowe. That's just to name a few. Are there, is there a particular director that you enjoyed working with the most? No, I mean, they all have those different qualities. I, I know, you know, I, 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 you can't do a, a, like an A-list with people like that. I mean, Cameron Crowe is sincere, dear, completely emotionally involved in things. I mean, Miller's Foreman makes directing look like it's as easy as getting out of bed and just going to get a cup of coffee. I mean, it's just the guy makes it look easy as hell. And I have a really funny story about how he learned about that. Bob Zemeckis sees the whole movie in his head before he shoots it. He's got it in his head. He can play it like a movie. He can close his eyes and, and play the scene he wants to shoot and run it like a movie. He can see everything. Sidney Pollack 
is on the edge of suicide before he starts a movie. He's so panicked and scared and uh, nervous. And he's a hyper responsible person. And then he's the dad on the set. He's the guy who knows everything about everybody's job and tells them so. I mean, I've had mentors all through my career. He was a really big one. Let me ask you this, because as you guys mentioned, uh, all the directors you've worked with, and I'm pretty sure you've been on some very, uh, a, a wide variety and range of sets. So let me ask you this. And when it came to the di directors and their style, which director would you say was, um, would you say was more out there, just running gun, just let's go, let's go with it. And, and by contrast, which director was more by the book, film school, we got to get it. We're not fixing it in post. Like, like which one of those st uh, stick out to you? So all right. Zemeckis, all right, Zemeckis, I wouldn't say by the book, but he knew where he had to go and what he wanted. And um, we, you know, by the time we did those three Back to the Futures with him, we understood how that all went. And before I started the first Back to the Future, the crew that he brought to Back to the Future had just finished Romancing the Stone. So they all had their shorthand down. So we were all pretty clear on what had to happen and how it had to happen. And it was always 100% the hardest way you could do it. That's what he wanted. And that's what, and it wasn't on purpose. It was just that he wanted the best. And, and why go 95% when if you take another, you know, half hour, you can go a hundred. So that's one way. I think every director is able to uh, come up with something on the fly and make it look pretty loose. Um, it isn't that they haven't thought about it. They always do, but it, they make it, they can make it seem as though they've just thought this up. Hey, you know, let's just run over here and do this kind of thing. But you'll find out later, they'd actually thought about it a lot. You can't go into, I don't think you can go into a film and not have a fairly good idea of how you want it to go. Um, even if it keeps you up all night, you know, I used to, I got up at, two o'clock in the morning on absence of malice in this tall building. I was in a Miami <clears throat> and I looked down, and I could see in the Sidney Pollock's apartment, he was up typing the rewrites for the next morning, you know, and that's kind of how it goes with these guys. Run and gun. My earlier films, you know, when I, I did a couple of, uh, of, uh, Oh God, Roger, uh, Roger. I did a Roger Corman film mm. that that would be run and gun, mostly run. Um, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Was that was that kind of Peter Fonda's approach as well? Yes, uh, a lot of the, it, it was because we were they were doing an outdoor film, a lot of it, and so it depended on a lot of things to set up the shots. Um, a lot of it depended on weather. A lot of it depended on where the light was, um, and it was a very difficult place. It was in the the craters of the Moon National Monument, in Idaho. It's all lava very difficult place to shoot. But yeah, there was a lot of running ground on that. Yes. But you know, the, the bigger the films got with the budget, the more locked in you, you had to be. It wasn't that you couldn't vary in what you're doing, but you, you had to be pretty locked in on the concept yeah. because there was a lot of money and a lot of very um, tough people there around who, who you, can't, you can't like just throw changes at them that fast. Yeah. You, know, you can with crews. You can't, you know, if the lead actors have, have gotten ready for a scene in a certain way and now you want to just go 180 on them, uh, you know, sometimes that's difficult. I'd like to talk about Rain Man for a few minutes. Uh, what would you say was your single greatest achievement with that production? I've never thought about it that way. Um, I think I, I, I watched it again yesterday because I, I wanted to be able to talk about it and I hadn't seen it in years. And I was really surprised at how emotional it was. And I think that that's saying, if I was proud of something, it, it was more a shared proud of, of how the crew and the cast worked together on that film. It was really something to behold. And we found out about halfway through the film that about 80% of people working on the film had either a direct in their family mental illness or they knew someone well who had a mental illness. So it brought this incredible level of sensitivity into everything that was going on from the way the focus pillars were working with the way obviously the actors were working, but it, they were surrounded in, in a really kind of unusual dome of people that were all focused on trying to bring out the best they could so that they could show Dustin's illness in the, in, in the most humane and healing way they could. 
To, yeah. to me, even to me, or at least uh, when it came out, of course, I was an, uh, not even adolescent of a child, but it was one of the first times I watched a film and said, this is the first time that something's ever shown me, any literature has ever shown me that, visual literature for that matter, that a, re- a person with a mental illness isn't just, they're not just dumb. There are things that they're great at. It's like, okay, because this is missing, they're hyper great at that. And so it made it cool to be like, wait a minute. They're smarter than me than this. I'll, I'll never be able to do that math problem, no matter what school I go to. But yet, you look at this person, you think that they're lesser than and they're more than. So that's something that I love. I mean, as a child, that made me feel great about that. Now, now let me ask you this. Such an iconic director, such as uh, such as Barry Levinson, at the moment, what was it? Okay, I, what was it like to work with him? But in the moment, did you even realize who you were working with and what this would be? I, I don't think anybody realized what it would be. We knew what we hoped it would be. That's the first thing. I was hired by Sidney Pollack. Sidney Pollack was um, supposed to be the director. So when I made my deal with Jerry Mullen, who was Sidney Pollack's co-producer, as uh, to be an associate producer and, and the AD, I, I thought I was going to be working on a Sidney Pollack film. Two or three weeks before production started, Sidney back um, because he could not solve the script problems that that were inherent in it and that needed change. He couldn't come up with the ideas. And I, I think um, Tom and Dustin had hard outdates. And so we, 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 had, we had to shoot on, on, on our scheduled days. Couldn't push the film. So one day we'd started prepping. And one day Sydney comes to us, he says, okay guys, you know, I'm leaving soon. I want you to come out with me and get in this van. We're going to Barry Levinson's house in Bel Air. And so, you know, the, the producers, the, the camera people, the, uh, the key grip, the, you know, the gaffer, I, me, we all get in this van and we drive to Barry Levinson's house and we walk into Barry Levinson's living room and we all shake hands with Barry and sit down and his wife who is incredibly pregnant is bringing us like coffee and stuff. And we sit there for an hour and talk with Barry and Barry to his great credit and bravery accepted the entire crew and he'd never worked with any of us. So there's one thing about Barry Levinson that I bet not many people know. And he was the perfect person for this story because he understood both those guys. He understood what Dustin was trying to do. Even if he didn't understand the illness he was trying to portray, he understood what Dustin was trying to pull off. And he understood the change that Tom had to have through the course of the show, which was basically from being you know, someone you really wouldn't want to be around to someone who had their heart opened. There were rewrites going on the way through. He, he, he liked to work fast. And sometimes it was too fast. And um, I've been debating uh, um, ever since I got your, your note about whether I should tell this story because I've never, honestly, I've never told anybody that's not a personal friend. Um, and Because I, I don't like to get into stuff like that about, you know, but I'm, I'm tell you because it's it's, it's a, a case in point for being an AD and being a director and being a, a star. Mm-hmm. Um, the camera people came to me at one point early on on the show and they said, it, "Can you help us? Barry is going too fast. We're, sometimes Dustin pulls something that we've never seen before and somewhere we're not ready for, and we're not hitting our focus stuff. We're close, but we're buzzing them. And Barry wants to move on. He's he said, "No, it's good enough. We got to go." And it's not good enough. We want to make this as good as we can. What can we do? So, uh, okay, I'm going to say it. So I went to Dustin and I I said, look, here's what's happening. And I'd work with Dustin on Tootsie. So I had a relationship with him. And I said, what do you think about if, if, if I work out a signal, if the camera people tell me they had a problem and I work out a signal with you, would you go and ask Barry for another take? Because he'll never say no to you. And he said, absolutely. And he said, let's go and talk to Tom. So we went and talked to Tom. Tom said, absolutely. And that's how we got around something that, you know, that could have been a problem. Yeah. We didn't use it a lot, very honest. (laughs) We used it about five times, but those are the kinds of things that come up on a film that people don't talk about. It isn't a slam on Barry. 
it isn't a slam on anybody, but it's how you make, it's how everybody is trying to pull for the same thing, which is to make it good. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of director that like, after working with so many different people, a variety of people in crew, I realize it's that it's hard to find that balance and know when you're working with is this somebody that's just a perfectionist and it will never be good enough or is this is this something that we actually need to do again and making those deci decisions on the fly when you're looking at the big picture as a director knowing what we still have left to do it's really easy to to just know we we got to move on and it's good enough especially if you like the performance yeah, you know, yeah. and and oh my God, that's what I wanted. You know, um, we we buzzed him. You know, what do you do? Anyway, I don't. He was very facile. You know, he was very he was very uh, he didn't get uh, heavy on people a lot. He kept it light. It, you had to listen to his words though. If he was if, if he wanted something changed, and he was telling you definitely, it had the nice tone to it. But it was very you had to listen to the subtext and 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 work with it. I liked him really a lot. He didn't, you know, he didn't know me from anybody. I could have been some guy off the street. He didn't know who I was or what I did or, or how I did it. So it was kind of hands off for a while, um, which I expected and understood. But um, I, think, I think by the time we all got rolling, uh, we had a good relationship. I liked him a lot and, I, and, and obviously was amazed by his talent, amazed by his writing talent and by his work with actors. And speaking of working with actors, well, I, so I was reading that Dustin Hoffman, um, he is just a treasure trove of interesting stories for what were the shenanigans on set. So the, the Vegas scene, um, I read that he kept slipping off to play Blackjack, um, and it was, it was eventually halting the production when, he, when crew would have to go find him. So they, uh, eventually he had somebody that was hired to just watch him in between takes. Yeah, so we, we put a PA in charge. I'm curious, are, like, how do you navigate those situations? And because like he had to notice, sorry, I now have a babysitter. So the, there's something like that that comes up. But was there was there ever a time that it felt like somebody was more trouble than they were worth? Well, never any more trouble than they were worth. They, they could be trouble, but you just that's part of what you do. So Dustin, you know, is playing this guy. He's, he's, he's very inward, this character. And he's sitting at the table under the lights in this crazy focus, wherever the hell he went for that character. And he changed the lighting around and he had to, he had to, you know, let it out, you know? So he would disappear. He, he, you know, put the stand-ins in, he'd, he'd go off to the side. And then after a while, yeah, it's like, oh, guys, where's Dustin? Um, I did hear on the radio, um, not sure. So after that happened a few times, he would go off to the tables and, and just jump in, do a few hands, enthrall people, of course. And, and then, you know, we'd, we'd get him back. So we put a PA with him. He'd stand way back where he wasn't intruding on what he was doing. We kept it all low key. He knew that somebody had to, you know, he wasn't trying to ditch us. He just, he had to go and, and get some air. On Tootsie, talking about going into roles, and, and maybe you can't use this, but I just want to tell you because it's so cool and how deep he went into that character of Dorothy, the woman. I caught him shopping with his wife on a weekend, dressed as Tootsie. <laughs> He would dress up as a woman and go around with his wife into all these places where women shopped and the dressing rooms and everything so he would understand what was going on. He loved it. Now that's method acting. Yeah, that is, that is method. Kids, kids out there, that if you yeah. want to commit, you got to commit. Um, I agree. One of the things that the stigmas out there for people who love film, but they don't want to make them, they just love watching them. One of the things that at least when you first growing up and you, I mean, people think that films are shot just like, hey, this scene, that scene. Like, oh, I love that story. They must have, like, from beginning to end, this is what they've done. But the, we all know in the industry that's not how it happens. 98% of the time, that's not what happens. So let's talk about Rain Man. It was shot mostly in sequential order, which is not the norm. And it actually followed the road trip. It follows the road trip that the characters take. So let me ask you this. Yeah. Was that more or less challenging than shooting a film out of order? 
either way would have been a challenge, but the, it, it had obvious benefits to everybody. And that was that the characters had a chance to evolve, it, it, you know, in sequence. And, they, and since it was uh, a script a lot of times in progress and characters a lot of times in progress, Dustin kept freaking out that he didn't have the character yet. He didn't have the character. We'd be two weeks in. He was like, I don't have him. I don't have him. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing with this. I got, I got to, I can't find him, you know? And so as we shot our way across the country, he, they, they gradually came in and Tom came in as this brash kind of guy, you know, and then watching Dustin, interacting with Dustin, watching Dustin go through the changes his character went through. And then we all evolved as, as a, as a crew and interacting with them. So to me, um, shooting in, in basically in order was fantastic. And, and it was a godsend. Um, if we've exploded the script the way, as you were saying, you know, it happens on so many shows for so many different reasons. But on this one, we, we decided, I don't know if it was a decision that was made before I got there or however, but that's how I boarded it. That's how we shot it. One thing about it, if you're interested, at the end of the show, now we're back in Los Angeles, we've been shooting out in Palm Springs and we're shooting the, the stuff in the car dealership and everything. And Dustin is unhappy about a scene that we shot in Cincinnati because he, now that he had grown into his character, he was looking back at it and thinking about it. And it was like, that isn't how, that, that wasn't, you know, I, I want to I wanna make it better. We went back to Cincinnati and reshot that coffee shop scene where they order pancakes and the toothpicks go on the floor. Mm -hmm. We went back and shot it. And I think a couple of other things too. I think the walk down the, from, from the uh, home where he was and stuff, we reshot a couple of things like that because he felt as though he had the way the guy walked and the way he uh, reacted to this better. That would be the definition of an A-lister. Talking about having cash. Hey, guys, you know what? You know what we shot two weeks ago? Let's go back and do it again. Now we're going. And it's, it's somebody that, like, I imagine that the, yeah. he, he's one of those people that the, the performance could always be improved upon. And that's, that's where, as the director, you have to find that, like, you know, when is it time to move on and put the foot down? It's so, true. You know, he didn't, he didn't put it to people, though, as an ultimatum kind of thing at all. He, um, they saw some of the cut footage and he taught, you know, he, he, he told Barry, he just said, I, I know I can do this better. And it's a pivotal, you know, pivotal scene, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we did it. And I can't remember whether we came in within the budget or whether that was more money that was given to us, but uh, we went back, we all went back. Couldn't believe it. We we're back there. We we're like, I cannot believe we're back in this coffee shop. <laughs> So uh, just watching the movie uh, the night before, is there, what, what is your favorite scene in Rain Man? I think um, the scene in the motel where Tom finds out that Raymond is Rain Man. The way it was played that night, it had everybody just like blown out, you know, because they, they got really emotional with it. And we shot that in sequence also. And it was just, um, we, we knew we had something. At that point, I think, at that scene, we uh, people would look around and went, "Wow, you know, I get it, you know, because it woke Tom up, and and it showed you a picture of Dustin the way he used to be, his, you know, the way his character used to be before he had all these problems." So, the Vegas stuff. But, you know, it was Vegas. We were all just having a blast. I mean, we, you know. I, I saw our prop man win thousands of dollars at the craps table. He actually, you know, we put it in his retirement. You know, he's using his per diem and gambling his per diem. And he was like really good. And we'd stand around and watch him. It looked like, you know, what we were trying to do with us and Tom, he was doing it at the craps table. Uh, you know, there are the, I like the family in the farm where they had to knock on the door and get him in to watch his TV program before he freaked. Um, those kids, there were six little kids there. That was, well, you can imagine, you know, trying to get them all to um, focus and, and, and stay with it. And, and, and Dustin's doing what he's doing, which is the kids are like, you know, what? <laughs> and Tom Cruise is there, P.S. So it was interesting and sweet. 
Very sweet. Dustin, Dustin and Tom were really sweet with the kids and the kids, you know, gradually relaxed and just became themselves. And we worked with them a little bit and I, I think it came off. We didn't, sh it, they didn't cut them into them as much as I thought they would, but I liked that scene too. Doing the rewatch uh, the other night, so you because you said you want to be able to talk about it. Was there a scene or a moment that you thought of like, hey, we're behind the scenes, like a fond, a fond memory? I know you, we talked about your favorite scene, but just a fond memory. Maybe maybe it was working with a crew member or somebody who wasn't supposed to be on set or a situation, a fire you put out that no one knows about. Was there a fond memory that came to mind watching that? Well, I can think of one. Um, there are two. Um, that come to mind fast. One is when we got to Las Vegas, Barry realized that he needed some more reaction from Dustin in the convertible as they came across country. So <laughs> we, he said, look, take Dustin, take the car and have him set up a camera and go out and drive around and, uh, and, and let Dustin act. You and Dustin just talk in the car and just drive around and get some stuff. That's what we did. I can so Dustin and I are out in this car with a, an Airflex and a, a mag of film. And we drove down toward um, the dam down there below Las Vegas. And Dustin would just trip on, you know, and, or I'd see something, I'd say, you know, is that something that you would trip on the, the reflections of it? Yeah, yeah. And so he'd do it, you know, and, and, so we just spent this afternoon doing these little pickup shots. I think a few of them are in the film, but that wasn't the point. The point was, we're just two guys out there trying to do this thing and make it better. So yeah, obviously, I, how, how could I not love that? For laughs, the, you know, the whole freak out that Tom did about the underwear and, and, and on the highway in the middle of nowhere, I just, I laughed my ass off at that. They were so funny. And yeah. Dustin just, just Dustin just <laughs> go the hell out of him. Just got his goat so bad. Just got him so spun. You know that when he jumped out of the car, he was really he was really freaking out. You know, and then the the one other one was the booth scene when they're in the phone booth. That was in the middle of Oklahoma, in the middle of nowhere. I'm not kidding you. There was nothing around for miles, and we we pulled up and we had a couple of cops with us. You know, and we started setting up, and all of a sudden cars just it was a four-way intersection cars start appearing and parking in the fields and you know going through the intersection and finding a place to park and suddenly there's like 80 people there and somehow the word had leaked out that we were filming and they all wanted to come and see you know Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman so Dustin is very outgoing. He jumped out of the trailer and said hello to everybody and signed autographs and was just so dear. And uh, um, Tom wouldn't come out. And I, I think he was busy. It wasn't, I don't, I think. Um, but Dustin, uh, being Dustin, grabbed everybody and went over and surrounded Tom's trailer and said this chant, Tom Cruise, come out. Tom Cruise come out. All these people are saying this, you know, and finally Tom comes and they burst into applause and he's like grinning, he's signing autographs, you know, and he kind of, Dustin goes by me, so I'm teaching I'll be a star. <laughs> <laughs> he's so cute. <laughs> oh, I, I love the story about uh, going out and shooting with Dustin Hoffman because I, I could see how that would be like, I, I never imagined that on a big production like that, there's those intimate moments where it's like when you like to me, if that was me, I'd be like, this is why I got in the film. This is what I enjoyed. Just the, that creative process on a on a like without all of the bells and whistles and everything right. that that comes with the production. When I did, you know, when we did Tootsie, I mean, that character of that woman was indelible. I mean, people just fell in love with her. She was so cool. And uh, the crew, I mean, she'd hang out with the crew and like. You know, he was just unbelievable. And so on Rain Man, we, in the beginning in Cincinnati, we had a couple of minutes one day and I was in the trailer and I was talking with Dustin and I was, we brought up Rain Man, I mean, Tootsie, we were talking about Tootsie and we were talking about some of the people and some, because Tootsie was a very, very tense, difficult, argumentative, pressure packed show. But we were working about the fun parts and the cool stuff. And as we were talking, Dustin, from being enthusiastic and laughing, just suddenly 
not suddenly, over the course of about 10 minutes, just got really quiet. And finally, I just said, what's up? You know, what's up? He says, oh, I don't know. You know, it's kind of weird. I guess sound kind of weird, but he says, you know, sometimes I, I really miss Dorothy. You really miss that. And, and I couldn't have agreed with him more. That's, that, that's a, uh, that was a solid yeah. Hoffman impression as well. Yes. <laughs> PAD post actors depression. <laughs> you, see, you can't leave the that, world alone. That that's incredible. That because how how long was Rain Man after Tootsie? Was, like how many? Well, uh, Rain Man was eighty eight. I think Tootsie was like eighty four. So it was like four or five years. So four years later, he's still kind of like the character is still in him somewhere. Yes. Very definitely. I hope nobody gives him the role of a serial killer. Yeah, he, <laughs> I, he, said he, he, he I said that to him. I said that to him. I told him, I said, I am so glad you're not playing an axe murderer in this show. <laughs> he laughs. I was going to ask this, Otto, and I know we're wrapping this up, but I wanted to ask this because I, I asked you to give back earlier and give advice and, 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 so, and speaking about the uh, being an AD, but now I want to ask you, of all the films that you've worked on and all the amazing talents uh, that you've worked with personally, What's the single best thing that you've learned that you personally could pass on to aspiring filmmakers? Don't be, don't have a rigid mindset. You never stop learning. I, I never stopped learning for the whole time I was in film. It was just like this gigantic learning curve that crews are, the crews, grip, electric, people like that are the backbone of a film, no matter what anybody says. They make a film happen. It's a cool business and, and, uh, the, and crew people are, to me, what make it cool. They are unbelievable people, most of them. There's no dumb people making films. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. So you, uh, you stepped away from film to support your daughter's aspirations in the competitive world of rhythmic gymnastics. And support doesn't even begin to give justice to the extent that you've fully involved yourself in her success. Um, I was reading a Huffington Post article from 2012 that detailed traveling to Prague, Slovenia, Bul Bulgaria, and crisscrossing the U.S. for competitions and special training yeah. camps. Um, you accompany her every road trip, competition, uh, manage all of her travel arrangements, and help with uh, even help with leotard designs, like, like pretty much her AD. And you were quoted in the article as actually saying that you spent over three decades in film to learn how to facilitate your daughter's gymnastic life. So at the time of the article, Natalie was in 10th grade. She went on to compete in the 2016 Olympics and is now 23. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Can you talk about that journey, what it was like to step away from, like you were, it wasn't like you were walking away from something that you weren't uh, amazing at you were walking away from a successful film career you know to trade that in for front row seats to your daughter's success okay I, i'll give you how it started first because this is this is when uh, as i look back on it you know a film a film was um increasingly taking time away from being with my family and i had little kids uh, they didn't know where the hell I went for month upon month. I mean, on the interpreter, I was gone for nine months in New York City across the country. Uh, after All the King's Men, uh, we went to a PTA raffle, my wife and I, my wife Shannon and I. And I saw my wife, they had sign-up sheets, you know, where you bid on things. So you, you bid the top line, you bid so much, somebody comes in and bids more. And I saw her on tiptoes signing uh, the top of the sign-up sheet. And she was across the room and I didn't think about it, but I saw her like 10 minutes later. I said, so what did we just buy? And she said, oh, honey, don't worry. She said, I just, I'm just getting the bidding started. It's for um, two free gymnastics lessons. At the end of the night, we got those two free gymnastics lessons. Nobody else bid on that sheet. There was one line, my wife's. A couple of weeks later, I said, Natalie, you know, who was like 35 pounds and, and bean pole, she ate her meals standing up. Uh, did her homework standing up, wired for sound. Um, I think you do you want to go out and take a look at this gym? She goes, okay. So my wife and I take her out to the gym. It's an artistic gymnastics, which is balance beam and you know that kind of thing. And they they said, okay, you parents stay here. We'll take her around the gym. Parents aren't allowed on the gym floor. And the girls team's working out. Come on, Natalie. And they take her off. 
and they're leading around the floor and they're showing her different people doing different things. And Natalie's looking and across the room, I see this woman with her arms folded, leaning against the wall, watching Natalie. And a few minutes later, she appears by, she said, is that your daughter? And we go, yeah. She goes, I wonder if she would spend one of those free gymnastics lessons with me. I teach rhythmic gymnastics. And she said this, I think I could do something with that girl. That's what she said to us. She was seven years old. What the hell did she see? I can't imagine. About two, four months later, I took her once a week and Natalie liked it. This coach came to me. She, she didn't like to talk to parents. She didn't like dealing with parents because kids were her deal. But she came to me, she said, look, I'm thinking maybe I might want Natalie to try to maybe compete in January, but it would mean she has to come more often to gym. And I said, being groovy dad, I said, oh, okay, well, let me talk it over with Natalie and see how she feels. And I'll tell you, you know, how she feels. And she goes, you do that. I'm riding home with Natalie on the freeway. She's so little, her feet stick straight off the front seat. And I'm, right, I'm on the freeway and I said, so Natalie, you know, your coach, you know, was thinking, and I told her what her coach said. And I said, so I, I just want to know, you know, what you would think about that. And this seven year old turns to me and looks me dead in the eye and says, dad, why do you think I'm doing this? And all the hair stood up on my arm, no idea that her focus was like that. And everything that she did, everything that she accomplished only came from her. We never pushed her. We never, we never had it in mind at all. It came completely out of the blue. And gradually, as I began to realize how much time this was going to take, work, the possibility of going to back, back to work just dropped away. It just kept going. Every time we finished a year, she finished, she won the Western championship in her little teeny level. And we went to the, um, to the national championships in Boston because we said, we're never going to do this again. You know, this is crazy. You know, we got to go and just see what it's like. And, and she did, you know, she got like 21st in the country or something, you got blown away. And who cares? You know, it was like, whoa. And our whole family went, you know, our son went and we came back and said, okay, cool. Now it keeps going. She won all the levels that she ever competed in except for one. And she lost that one by a 10th of a point because she had 101 fever. And, but I mean, that wasn't, she wasn't even competitive with other people. She didn't work on beating people. She worked on being better. That, and then the national team asked her to come and do this four year experiment with them. She had moved to Chicago though, if she wanted to go, that's where the national team trained. Would she consider being one of five girls training for the Olympics uh, on the national team of rhythmic gymnastics group, which is five girls that do a routine together. It's incredibly complex. Uh, she'd never even thought of it before. I said, well, you know, she said, what do you think I ought to do? And I said, that's your choice. I can't tell you, your mom can't tell you, your coach can't tell you, and your friends can't tell you, you have to do it. You tell me what you decide and we'll do it. And two weeks later, we're on our way out to training in Simi Valley. I was driving 125 miles a day with her, but uh, we're on our way out to training and she looks at me as we're leaving our house and driving down the hill and she says, daddy, I think I wanna go. And that's what happened. She and I moved there. Um, my wife followed up after we leased our house and our son went off to college. He went off trying to help and got a four year fully paid scholarship to Cooper Union. So he didn't cost us any money because this whole thing was done on my retirement. It's a parent funded sport. I'm not rich. Everybody in the article assumed I'd, I'd you know, retire Beverly Hills with a mansion and a giant you know, bankroll. Nothing could be further than from the truth, guys. And I promise you that is not BS. I mean, we live in a 1300 square foot house, um, modestly, always have, don't aspire to more, but it takes a lot of money, <laughs> but it was, it was worth it. I'm you know? sure it means the world to her too, even if it was later on as she got older to understand, uh, it, I wouldn't use the word sacrifice, but the fact that, uh, her dad made her priority number one, like without a doubt. But it was a family deal. It was all done. Everything had to be for, it had to be for 100% votes. Otherwise, you know, moving to Chicago. Okay, guys, what do we think? And, mm -hmm. and Evan, our son said, let's go for it. You know, and that's how it happened. Yeah. 
Well, I will say this now. Most people can't top your AD resume, but for, I mean, we're two dads. We have daughters, uh, but to us, you're a GD, a groovy dad, definitely a groovy job, man. I mean, you've been you've been killing it, man. So, like I say, I always tell people at the end of the day, it's not about. <laughs> To me, a director and actor is is it's not what I am. It's what I do. A father is what I am and what I love and what I will always be. And I, I try to tell people that, man. It's my favorite thing. I yeah. love being a dad and a husband. Good. It's the best thing I've ever done. Before you get to your uh, the final question, I just wanted to. I know that you um, you've recently wrote a book that's going to be coming out in the future soon ish. I was intrigued to know what someone with with your life what uh, how that translated into liter literature what that book is about and if you could tell us a little bit about it when i sat in the gym for six seven hours a day with natalie i realized that i better figure out something to do so i joined a gym myself and then i thought well okay now that's good you're physically okay now what are you going to do with your brain because you can't just sit there and watch girls work out that's crazy so i thought okay i'm going to write some stories about things that i loved about my work for my kids because they don't know what I did. I was, they were too little. Uh, they didn't know why there was so much. And uh, so I, I want them to know. And that's how it started. That started in 2011. And I finished it about a month, about, well, I, I mean, every time I open it, I find something I can change. But I, essentially, I finished it this year. It's about 78 short, like one to six page, just episodic things that happen, little, like little stories like we've been talking about here of things that made a difference to me about the people I worked with or the situations I got in. And so it's for kind of um, people who like film and, and also people who wanna know what the business is like behind the scenes. And what is the book called? It's called Best Seat in the House, strangely enough. Um, and it's um, the subtitle is an assistant director behind the scenes of feature films. And this is the cover that I'm thinking of trying to do. And I don't know if you can see it, but that's a shot from Back to the Future 3. I'm standing in the street with all these people running around. And, and I want to show you one other shot that is in the book. If, I, if Neil Preston will give me permission, and I think he will. This is um, w right before we shot. Uh, uh, in on Times oh, Square, wow. it's Tom and me going over because I, I cued the whole shot with him. So that's in the book. It's stuff like that. It's like it was how we pulled off Times Square. It's like how Milos Foreman faked me out, um, making directing look easy. A uh, lot of stuff. I'm going to tell you something I told him and I'm asking you, I'm going to segue this into the last question. I told him when he told me uh, who we were going to, who we, like when he told me who we booked, I was like, okay, let me do my research. And I was like, are you sure we got the right guy? That's number one. And I was like, okay, it's really him. That's number one. But one of the things I talked about, I'm like, dude, he did the Rick Moranis. And what I, what, what I meant by that was that you, for whatever situation happened in your life, you put your kid in front of your career. And most people don't understand that. Like, like, again, that child means so much to you. Then like, like he mentioned, she's never going to forget that. So you leave a lasting memory. Your films, no matter how long they're out there, will never make more of an impression than you've made on her for what you've done. It's not a sacrifice. It was, it was an honor to do what you did. So we want to commend you from that here at the show. And uh, so I guess one final question that I guess if we didn't have you, I would ask Rick Moranis, which would be is, Hey, what's your favorite thing? Or should I say, what do you miss most about being on set, no matter what it is? The, the crews I worked with, they were, they, they were my life's education. They, they work, you know, you would not believe the things they take care of behind the scenes, the directors, producers, people have no idea what is going on and, and, um, and the, the depth of the commitment that goes on, the knowledge they have, the, the workarounds they have for things that, that they have, you know, oh, we don't have money for that. You can't do one of those, you know, and they figure out a way to do it with no money and the commitments they make. And they all are dads and moms too. And they all have families that are going on. And uh, they're, I mean, people don't give crews enough credit. It's normal. Um, and they're fine with that. They are used to working behind the scenes and without a lot of shout outs but I shout them out when I can. There's nothing cooler than being able to represent a crew. That's another thing I really liked. You have such a, a genuine, um, just authentic, the, the, way that you, the way that you look at the industry and the work that you've done and the people you've worked with 
it's so it's so real and also respectful. I'm sure that the the book you wrote is going to be very interesting. And for for anybody that has seen all of the films that you've worked on, I'm sure they'll find interest in it. And people that are filmmakers, um, well, I'm sure there's insight from that perspective as well. I want people to know why I loved what I did, and I did love it. You can't. I don't think you can do what what I did in the way that I did it without loving it. You know, you just, you can't. And um, so I don't, I don't know how that's going to work yet. I'll, I'll tell you when I know. Okay. Right. <laughs> Modest. <laughs> well, so we'll just say, keep an eye out for uh, David, McGiff David McGifford's book, Best Seat yes. in the House. Um, just Google it every month or so, see if anything pops up. And if it does <laughs> purchase it, that's, <laughs> Uh, David, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us. I, I, um, I had to look twice too to make sure you had the right guy. I, I was surprised that you <laughs> <laughs> that you asked me, and I thank you. It's been fun, and um, I, um, I'll see you around. It right, was an honor. You, thank you. Have a good All night. Right. All right. Take care. Find us in all these links. It's coming up right now. Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer.